Good morning and welcome everyone to today's webinar with Dr. Judy Ragsdale and Kate Desjardins titled, What is Your Theory of Chaplaincy? I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. We have over 400 registrants who are really excited this morning. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping questions. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. You'll have the opportunity to submit some questions to our guests by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel that's located at the side of your screen. If we have time at the at the very end, we'll get to those, but we'll have those questions collected, uh, at, you know, during the during the event. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. George Fichet, Executive Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks, friends, for being with us. Uh, I want to uh, say how exciting it is for us to be able to do this webinar today. Um, um, research about chaplaincy, theories about chaplaincy, the world of chaplaincy is changing. Um, and it's really exciting for us to be able to kind of be in dialogue with this um, uh, team of presenters and respondents and with all of you ab about those changes. Um, so really grateful for everybody uh, who agreed to be part of today's um, webinar. And I wanna begin uh, by introducing Janet Troutman Miller, Jana is a chaplain at St. John's on the Lake in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and is a member of the Board of Directors of the Association of Professional Chaplains. And Jana is the chairperson uh, of the Board of um, Chaplaincy Certification of APC. So who better to kind of uh, convene a, a conversation about theories about chaplaincy? Thanks so much, Jana. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. It is a privilege to be here with you all and to be here to introduce um, our panelists for today. Um, we will begin with having our presentation with um, Judith Ragsdale and Kate Michelle Desjardins. Um, Judy, an ACPE certified educator, is the Senior Director of Pastoral Care at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and an associate professor in the Division of General and Community Pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Kate is a Transforming Chaplaincy Fellow, convener of the Pediatric Spiritual Care Research Network, and the Executive Director of Mennonite Healthcare Fellowship. They will begin our time together giving us a look at their Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy recently published research proposing religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory. Their presentation will then be followed by respondents, Reverend Lori Garrett Cobina and Reverend Dr. Steve Nolan. Lori is the Associate Professor of Pastoral Care and Education and Shaw Chair of CPE at the Graduate School of Theology of the University of Redlands. She's also the Director of the Shaw Chaplaincy Institute and an ACPE Certified Educator. And Steve Nolan is Chaplain for Princess Alice Hospice in Escher, UK and Visiting Research Fellow at the University of Winchester in Winchester, UK. Uh, after our presentation and responses, uh, as time allows, we'll take questions for those of you watching, if you'd like to um, add those into the, the question feature. Um, and then any questions that we are unable to get to today, we will try to respond um, at another time. So again, it is my privilege to be here and to welcome each of you um, as you present to us on this really important and exciting topic. Um, and so Judy and Kate, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jana. Thank you, George, for offering us this opportunity. And of course, Kate and I are very grateful to get to speak with you. Um, I'm going to be occasionally looking over to my left because the truth is I've not memorized all of this and so I have notes. So first, let us define religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory. It is a proposed middle range prescriptive theory of healthcare chaplaincy, and we'll define more of these terms later, bringing together in a new way the importance of religion and spirituality, the people of faith receiving healthcare, and the interpersonal competence of clinically educated chaplains. So people of faith using healthcare, clinically educated chaplains, 
coming together, we have purposefully used the term religion rather than spiritual in naming the theory. The term religion describes a wide variety of worldviews developed and used to express what different traditions have defined as sacred. Religious traditions guide their adherents' understanding of events such as illness, accidents, abuse, death, grieving. Religions provide expectations for conduct resulting from their understanding of the sacred. The term spiritual is more person-centered than tradition-centered, and since spirituality has become accepted nomenclature for assessing the use of both religion and spirituality, we can find the terms in our papers. Due to the fact that I'm a Luddite, Andy um, is going to move the slides. So Andy, I'm going to say the magic word next. All right, the three components of religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory. The first is that religion and spirituality is used by many people of faith in the context of healthcare for meaning making, coping and decision making. We want to make it clear that the use of religion is not just to be addressed around spiritual struggle, but also the use of religion in the day to day experiences of patients and families. So, for instance, um, for Muslim people observing Ramadan, that has impacts for health care for Jewish people observing the high holidays or Shabbat that has implications for their health care experience. So the people second component who are the best skilled and able and should on the healthcare team assess and address the use of religion, religious practices are the skillful relational, the relationally skillful chaplains. We're the members of the healthcare teams who should own religion and spirituality as it's assessed and addressed. The third component is the interdisciplinary team. And we propose in our theory that interdisciplinary teams can provide improved patient-centered personalized care when incorporating relevant religious and spiritual beliefs and practices into the treatment plan. Next slide, thank you. Um, if you would like to read the article, here's the citation. It was published in the Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy at the end of 2020. I want to say that all of the work that is based on this theory was done at Cincinnati Children's Hospital by staff chaplains, CPE residents, and chaplain research fellows. Um, I want to say a couple things. We have three vignettes that, that outline each of the um, components and we could not fit them all in. I do want to say the first is by Chaplain Lizzie Diop in psychiatry. She is working with a 14 year old patient and in narrative spiritual assessment, Lizzie is able to help this child define her spiritual strengths and also her spiritual struggle. She believed that she was at fault for her own abuse. So Lizzie working together with this child created an intervention a prayer that she could pray every day to help her with the spiritual struggle. The second example that we're not going to go into in depth is um, Cindy Jones. Chaplain Cindy Jones does a wonderful job working with a Muslim family from the Middle East, helping the treatment team assess whether this family's child is a good candidate for lung transplant. Because of her ability using an interpreter, because they spoke Arabic, Cindy was able to have this family describe how they understood this child's illness, let the team know they're telling this child he is a warrior, that Allah has chosen him, and that this whole process of lung transplant is something that Allah is calling them to. So she could let the team know this family would be using their faith in the interest of adherence. She was able to recommend the child for a lung transplant. Now, next slide, please, Andy. The um, case I wanted to focus on for our time, I think is more common to chaplains. I think many of us have experience working with families who believe in a miracle and who are waiting for a miracle and who don't, do not want members of the interdisciplinary team coming in the room with bad news. I wanted to offer this case because Chaplain Amy Simpson in this vignette really lives out all three of the component pieces. This family is using their faith in the context of healthcare, they do not want to talk to other people on the team that are coming in with bad news. 
they know that Amy does not do faith in exactly the way they do. Although they are Christian and Amy's Christian, they're understanding she is outside their faith group. Because of component number two, her in-depth relationship skill, Amy is able to stay connected with this family. And the father is the spokesperson for the family, and she talks with him about how do you know when God is guiding you? How do you understand God's guidance? And the father says, well, of the ways that God guides him, one way is through other people. And Amy's able to work with him and say, might God be able to use members of the interdisciplinary team to give you information about your child? And the father considers that. That makes some sense to him. Next slide, please, Andy. The other side of this equation, of course, is the healthcare team. And Amy also has exquisite relationship with the healthcare team, such that even though they're afraid to talk about faith and want to just talk about the medical facts, and you can imagine this, and we've seen this, some of us, the team understands the family's use of faith, and they're so scared of saying or doing something offensive, and they're also kind of frustrated because faith is like a block. So Amy works with the team to say, how about if you just let the family know that you understand how important their faith is to them and how hard it must be for you to hear them bring you this news. So in one of the final meetings that this family and this medical team have, the doctor does exactly what Amy has coached the doctor to do and says, we know your faith is very important to you. The father is taken aback by this, moved to tears, something opens in this log jam and this family and this medical team are able to create a comfort care plan for this patient who ultimately died in our hospital. Component three, the medical team is having the experience of responding sensitively as coached by the chaplain to the family's use of faith. Next slide, please, Anthony. Each component of Religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory. John Eman helped a lot with the writing of this article. He coached me through, what if you say this sentence differently? And so he suggested RIRSCT might beneficially be put to Aretha Franklin's respect. Um, I haven't quite figured out how to do that, and I'm not going to try to sing it. But all of these components are connected to research studies. Um, next slide, please, Andy. The first component, religion and spirituality, is used by many people of faith in the context of healthcare for meaning making, coping, and medical decision making, and just plain decision making, as I said earlier. Um, how do we live our lives in the hospital given different religious practices we need to address? Next slide, please, Andy. Time will not permit going through all of these studies, but I wanted them on the screen because they are all pretty amazing studies. The first, if you haven't read it, is the Malboni study, the support of cancer patients, spiritual needs and associations with medical costs at the end of life. They found when patients' spiritual needs are addressed at the end of life in the hospital, it decreases medical costs. This could be a good argument for chaplaincy, but they are not making the case that the chaplain is the person who needs to address those needs, hence our study. Um, next slide, please, Andy. Not our study, our theory. I really want to lift up Daniel Grossamy's work. I honestly believe Daniel has done a ton of work on the use on exploring how people use their religion in the service of treatment adherence. Daniel used to be at Cincinnati Children's, and this is how Cindy Jones knew to explore with the family, how does your faith impact your approach to treatment? So this is a great study, and several of Daniel's studies are good. I also really want to lift up Ken Pargament's 2007 Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy. Ken Pargament almost single-handedly has worked with multiple teams to demonstrate that different religious traditions approach religious coping differently. He has also worked with Julie Exline and their new book in 2000, um, will come out in 2021 on spiritual struggle. This book on spiritually integrated psychotherapy lifts up over 250 research articles. And I wanna say, Ken shows that spiritual struggle can lead to growth 
if the person is willing to address aspects of their belief system that they experience as problematic. The implication for chaplaincy is that addressing spiritual struggle in the context of healthcare could be significantly beneficial to patients. You may say, well, Ken Parmet is a psychotherapist. He's got a lot of meetings. I reference Lizzie Diop's one meeting with that child in which she assessed that child's use of faith, spiritual struggle, and created an intervention. One meeting. Um, next slide, next slide, please, Andy. The second component of religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory proposes that relationally skillful chaplains are the members of the healthcare team who should be responsible for assessing religion and spirituality. When we started doing this at Cincinnati Children's, I did not know, but it turned out a lot of the chaplains thought, well, we're just supposed to go in and ask these questions. Oh, no. The relationship skill is essential. We are asking families to talk about, for some of them, patients and families, the most intimate relationship some of them have, which is their relationship with the sacred. This requires exquisite relationship skill to go in and raise the topic of faith and explore it is really, it's important to have the skills. So not just knowledge about how religion works, not just ongoing knowledge about how different religions and spiritualities work, but helping people describe how they are applying their faith to the healthcare context. A really good place to learn these relationship skills and to incorporate religion and spirituality is CPE. Um, next slide. Thank you. So how do um, chaplains using relationship skills work with the interdisciplinary team? George Hanzo's work. What do chaplains really do? Patrick Jink's case study, Kevin Massey's um, taxonomy. The top 10 of the taxonomy activities and interventions that chaplains use are a poster board for chaplain relationship skill. So I think that's a really important study. Next slide, please. I look very forward to hearing from Steve Nolan, who I'm just meeting today, but I think lifting the lid on chaplaincy shows a lot about the relationship skill that chaplains bring to the practice of chaplaincy. On this slide in particular, I want to lift up um, Michelle Shields and Allison Kestenbaum and Dr. Don and the incredible work they've done with spiritual aim, which is spiritual assessment and intervention model. I want to highlight one of their sentences. This is the first study. They've done some more work with spiritual aim. They've done some great work with this. In this study, they write, core to spiritual aim is the chaplain's use of herself or himself or themselves and the relationship with the patient to make a spiritual assessment and facilitate healing. Great study. Next slide, please, Andy. The third component proposes that healthcare interdisciplinary teams could provide improved patient-centered personalized care when incorporating patient religious and spiritual beliefs and practices into the treatment plan. Next slide, please. So, um, Analika Daman's work, I should have gotten coaching on how to pronounce her first name, but, but she and her team did a great job with what do chaplains do and the, the perspectives of the palliative, palliative care team members is fascinating. Susan Astro, um, importance of the patient's spirituality as part of care, assessment and intervention. Jankowski, hands on Flannelly, testing the efficacy of chaplaincy care. I really like this study. I think it's one of the only studies I've found that measures not patient satisfaction, but what difference does the chaplaincy care make? For 15 of you that know other studies, do let me know. Next slide, please. Kuchalski, George tried to coach me on that. I'm probably not saying it right. Improving the quality of spiritual care as a dimension of palliative care. The study I really want to lift up here, the strongest in this set is Jeannie Warps's for this purpose, for this purpose. Jeannie and her colleagues surveyed 463 chaplains, they reported that qualitative analysis yielded a multifaceted picture that includes chaplain attention to the impact religion has on decision making, a focus on the patient's story, and chaplain as mediators between patients, families, and the healthcare team. 
This is a great study. Next slide. Thank you, Andy. Thanks to Kate. I am not going to go through the spiritual screening assessment and templates. Those are in the handouts. Thank you, Kate. Next slide. CPE curriculum here at Cincinnati Children's has incorporated material um, around this theory for several years. The book God is Not One by Stephen Prothero is great. He says this idea that really all of the traditions lead to a deeper love of God and respect for each other. Stephen Prothero says, no, not exactly. Each religion is based on a different fundamental question that the founder of that religion or that approach to spirituality is using this religious tradition to answer. In their volume, um, Bapajit and Dambra, The Soul of Medicine, there are several chapters, each written by a physician from a different faith tradition about how that physician's faith impacts the practice of medicine and their work with their patients. In the paper is a vignette by a graduate from our program, Chaplain Chris Young, two of my favorite sentences from the paper. Thanks to RIRSCT, my chaplaincy education included educational and clinical experience with patients and families who utilize their Wiccan spirituality. I was able to ask about this patient's practice in a way that was invitational for the patient and demonstrated that I had an understanding of their spirituality. Thank you, Chris Young. Not in the paper is an example from Orthodox Rabbi Yisrael Kaufman, our most recent chaplain. Um, Yisrael, I asked to present to our CBE residents on spiritual struggle in Orthodox Judaism. Sitting in before that presentation, he heard us discuss um, Ross Morin and colleagues, do spiritual struggles predict poor physical and mental health outcome among Jews? Yisrael was not feeling good about their definition for spiritual struggle and said, I really think much more about spiritual struggle as people that wind up leaving the practice of the faith because of their struggle. And so he found a book by Farinach Margolis subtitled, Why Observant Jews Leave Judaism. Um, Israel is not a researcher, but he did research and he found this author in Israel and he said to her, do you think spiritual struggle is part of the reason observant Jews are leaving the faith? And she said, of course. And he said, it didn't make it in your book. Now, he also was working to update our spiritual screening and assessment based on what observant Jewish people believe. Um, as you can see, our assessment needs some more work to go deeper into how different faiths actually operate. Next slide, please. Also not in the um, article, but I thought this was a great demonstration of a systems intervention. Last year at Cincinnati Children's, we had um, a conflict around whether staff members at our medical center could wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts. A few of us in chaplaincy tried to advocate for wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts and we were unable to impact dress code policy. So I thought, what would this theory lead us to do? What is a religiously informed intervention? So I reached out to our African American Professional Advisory Council and said, what would you think about having weekly prayer services to address racial justice? and to talk about racial injustice as it impacts healthcare and to pray about it and to provide education through the announcements each week. They said, we would love to do that. And so um, together with Amy Simpson, whose vignette I shared, Amy and I, and I believe also on today's call is Ms. Edwina Hairston, each week write a service in support of racial justice. We say racial justice is a spiritual matter. Racial injustice impacts health care. And we do not say publicly, but what is true, and I say to you, chaplains here are advocating for racial justice in health care. At each service, we do readings from Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism in support of racial justice. And we have some great music. Thank you. Next slide. Now I'm going to shift to talking about theory. Proposing a theory. Theory is a way of using research. It's a way of connecting research to practice. The theory we're proposing is middle range, which means we are not developing a theory for specific, we are developing a theory for specific phenomena, the use of religion in healthcare, use of spirituality in healthcare. And we are not claiming that this is a grand theory that would guide all of chaplaincy. 
we know a lot of chaplaincy is not done with people who are using faith or spirituality. Middle range, specific phenomenon we're addressing in this theory. Next slide. Types of theory. The two types of theory our article addresses. One is descriptive theory, which is what's done in George Hanzo's general theory of what chaplains do. I believe, and it'll be interesting to hear from Steve, I think it's also when you lift the lid on what chaplains are doing, this is describing what chaplains do. Ours is a prescriptive theory. It's a different type of theory. It's saying, based on the research, this is what we think chaplains should be doing. Different type of theory. Next slide, please. The definition of theory we're using is from the discipline of nursing. It turns out nursing is all about theories. So we went to Walker and Avant and the theory definition they use an internally consistent group of relational statements. So our three components relate to each other that present a systematic view about a phenomenon and is useful for a description, explanation, prediction and prescription. They say that not, no theory is able to do all of these things. And we've talked about how our, ours explains how chaplaincy could be done and how that could impact the healthcare experience by working with patients, families, and the treatment team and prescription. Next slide. How RIRSCT was developed. The proposed theory, oh no, Kate, I'm into your time. The proposed theory was constructed via synthesis, which is relating known concepts in a new way to propose a theory that can be tested. Next slide. Our purpose in creating this theory, religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory, we wanted to make a theoretical case that religion is a discipline and chaplaincy is the profession responsible for respectfully and sensitively and effectively clinically engaging the use of religion and spirituality in healthcare. And now I give you Kate Desjardins. Next slide. When Judy was speaking about uh, the role of a prescriptive theory, there's two pieces there. And one is it's a theory meant to guide practice, but also meant to guide ongoing research. And as, as we conceptualize this theory and started to um, apply this theory, one of the reasons that I argue, we've had some conversations and we may have some conversations here, is this a theory or is this a model? One of the reasons I argue it's a theory is that I think it leads to many different models. Um, there is not a single uh, model that comes out of this theory. There are many models that I think would actually, for chaplaincy, that would be consistent with and out of RIRSCT. But all of these need further research. Um, so here is the paper where we have described this theory and it's time to test it. And so one of my questions is how does one test a theory in practice? And I think that we started at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We started uh, on what would be a first phase, which is feasibility and acceptability. Um, will ch do chaplains find that this theory does uh, both describe their work as well as prescribe um, what they hope to be doing in their practice? And we certainly found at Cincinnati Children's, and you will read in the paper, there are reflections on using this theory and practice, um, many positive, a few with some questions that it raises. Um, and I think that those kinds of conversations are incredibly important. And one of the next steps is to have some focus groups to talk about this theory um, and how it applies to practice outside of what I call it, we call a quaternary pediatric medical center. This is a very specific environment. Cincinnati Children's Hospital is somewhat along the Bible Belt of the US. So we're very aware that we have a particularly religious population as well. Um, although in pediatrics, we do see a lot of younger parents, so we certainly have that population of nuns as well. And as Judy said, this isn't a theory trying to say this is everything about chaplaincy. We hope that chaplaincy uh, has many theories and that us publishing this theory is an invitation to others to start thinking about their own theoretical bases. 
I think the next step in research is case studies. Um, I did write and present a case study uh, that drew upon this theory. Um, I actually uh, had the interactions with this young adult before uh, Judy, uh, we started talking about this theory. But once I heard this theory, I said, oh, this theory describes so beautifully what happened in those interactions. Um, and so more case studies that directly engage with this theory and how the case fit and did not fit with RA or SCT will be very important. And I think one of the really important next steps in chaplaincy research for many of us is engaging more patient reported outcome measures. Um, there's a formal prom that was developed in Scotland. We call that the Scottish prom. Um, that's wonderful at Austin Snowden, if you have a chance to see that. And prompts can look like many different things. This is really when we go back to our patients and we say, what difference did our care make for you? This is not patient satisfaction. It is a very different thing. This is patient outcomes of chaplaincy care. And I think it would be interesting to do RCT, stands for randomized control trials. What does it look like when um, two chaplains or maybe the same chaplains work with families with similar religious backgrounds and one of them really um, prescribes their care, works their care out of RIRSCT informed practice and another doesn't. And how do families respond to that? What kind of outcomes do we see? Um, and I think about intrinsic chaplaincy outcomes. This is something also that Annalika Daman has written about and George Fichet in how we do research and making sure that the outcomes we're looking for are really intrinsic to chaplaincy. So things like spiritual peace, um, a sense of support in making decisions, a sense of real integration of faith into practice. Um, and I also think it would be helpful to do outcome measures. Uh, I'm calling them IDT, so interdisciplinary team reported outcome measures. How does the team um, of non-chaplains that we work with respond to a chaplaincy model or models? I've said there can be different models out of RIRSCT um, that is informed by that. How do they respond to that? Do they feel from their perspective that uh, this claim in RIRSCT, one of our tenants, chaplains should be the ones doing this relationally skillful, religiously informed care? Do they feel that patients are having the kind of outcomes that we're hoping for? So these are just a few ideas of next steps in research uh, and how we might think about as we hopefully develop a lot of theories in chaplaincy practice, what are the next steps from theory development? Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, I would like to now invite Steve and Lori to respond. And then um, after that, Judy and Kate can respond to their responses. All right, Bill, to go. If either one of you want to go ahead and Steve, go. Would, you, would you go because you're, I think, very central to this and in the article and um, I want you to have some primacy on time. OK, thank you. Um, OK, well, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I, I, I greatly um, appreciate the paper that Judith and Kate have published. Um, I think they've drawn attention to a very important, if uh, if not a uniquely important aspect of the contribution that chaplains make to the care of patients uh, in, in whatever area of speciality. Um, I, I, in, I'm in palliative care, end of life care, um, and uh, certainly has resonance for the work that I do here in the hospice. Um, belief in whatever structured or non-structured form it, it may take is at the core of who we are as human beings uh, and at the core i think of what what we do as chaplains we essentially work with people's beliefs and um, everyone believes something there's no such person as a non no, no matter how many times um, we like to record non in a, in a patient's notes, uh, such people don't exist uh, when it comes to belief. So the fact that Judith and Kate so clearly recognise and articulate this role uh, is as one of the unique contributions 
the chaplain makes to the multi-professional multi care team is, I think, important and valuable. Having said that, um, I feel as if I'm going to go out on a limb here, uh, and I'm very aware that I'm sitting on the other side of the Atlantic, which may skew my perspective. Uh, but I want to say that there are two things about the paper that I have concerns about. Um, one is a formal concern. Uh, the other, I think, is more substantive. Uh, the one concerns the nature of theory, and I know uh, Judith uh, and Kate have spoken about that. Um, the other um, concerns what I see as the strategic development of chaplaincy. So thinking formally, uh, I guess my question is whether religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory is a theory. Uh, and I, I, with respect to um, what's already been said, I'm not sure it is. Um, the Oxford Companion to Philosophy describes a scientific theory as an attempt to bind together in a systematic fashion the knowledge that one has of some particular aspect of the world of experience. The aim is to achieve some form of understanding where this is usually cashed out as, an exp as explanatory power and predictive fertility. There may well be better uh, definitions of, of theory, but um, th this is a convenient one. Uh, obviously, the key phrases in that definition are explanatory power and predictive fertility. In other words, a theory is something that explains and helps us to understand how things might work out in ways that can be tested in the real world. Now, I imagine that Judith and Kate uh, we'll accept that as a definition, but we'll point out, um, as they already have indicated, that actually it's a definition that applies to general theories, and that theirs is intended not as a general theory, but as a middle range prescriptive theory, one that, as they say uh, in their paper, develops theory for a specific phenomenon. However, my response would be that I don't think religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory does itself fulfill the criteria that they claim for middle, for middle range um, prescriptive theory, in, um, which it should be capable of description, explanation, prediction, and prescription. For me, religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory describes a basis for a model of chaplaincy that is rooted in its capacity to address with relational skill a person's religious and or spiritual beliefs. Um, in other words, in ways that are religiously literate. For me, religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy is less a theory than it is a logical argument. So if we consider the form of the paper, Judith and Kate discuss three components of their theory. These components, as they've articulated very clearly, well, first of all, that some healthcare patients make use of religion, spirituality within their healthcare. Secondly, that chaplains should be the relationally skillful members of the healthcare team whose role it is uh, to address the patient's religion, spirituality. Uh, and thirdly, that healthcare teams will be better equipped to provide care congruent with patients, religion, spirituality values by making use of relationally skillful chaplains. I hope I've represented that accurately. And I have no argument with those points whatsoever. Um, as such, I would suggest that the paper um, or the components um, have a syllogistic structure which we could clarify as a the healthcare outcome sorry the healthcare of some patient, patients benefits their religious and or spiritual beliefs uh, when they're addressed b chaplains are those members of health the healthcare team who are relationally skillful in addressing 
religious and spiritual beliefs. Therefore, C, healthcare teams that use relationally skillful chaplains to address the religious and or spiritual beliefs of appropriate patients um, will better provide care that will benefit those patients. Now, it may be that my inability to see religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory as a theory is simply um, a uh, sorry, a, a linguistic problem on my part. Um, you're very likely familiar with the observation um, that the US and the UK are two nations separated by a common language. And it may be that I'm simply misconceiving something fundamental about the way that the word theory is used in the US. I noticed that Judith and Kate cite George Hanzo's 2012 essay, the subtitle of which is A General Theory for Providing Spiritual Pastoral Care. But rereading Hanzo, I honestly struggle to find anything that comes close to explanation or prediction. What I find is a very thorough description of one particular model of chaplaincy, a model that he says uses palliative care as, as its paradigm. And I think that Judith and Kate have given us something similar, not a theory, but a logical argument for a particular chaplaincy model. Um, a model that in this case argues for the inclusion of chaplaincy because chaplains are religiously literate. But you might say that I'm just straining at gnats here, nitpicking as we, as we say. Um, well, that's possible. Um, but I don't think so. Any constructivist understands that language is important because language constructs reality. And if religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory is even a partial theoretical explanation of chaplaincy, a specific phenomenon, um, I think it may be a theory that could be detrimental to the strategic development is the transformation, if you will, of chaplaincy. And this is my second concern, which is, as I say, substantive, which is, um, again, putting it in the form of a question, how might adopting religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory, even as a partial theoretical explanation, impact chaplaincy's development? So the preamble, excuse me, The preamble to today's webinar highlights the fact that chaplains, the chaplains in literature hasn't had many theories. Uh, as I've said, I personally don't think George Hanzo's so-called general theory qualifies as such because it offers no form of explanation and has no predictive power in terms of generating testable hypotheses. And certainly the recently published A Christian Theology of Chaplaincy by uh, Caperon, Todd and Walters, published in 2018, failed, I think, spectacularly to deliver anything theologically, uh, sorry, any theologically informed theory of chaplaincy. Nor could it hope to have done from such a partisan perspective. Now, the reason I make this claim is that, in my belief, any theory of chaplaincy that comes from a religious perspective or that privileges the religious perspective will at best only ever be able to provide a partial explanation of chaplaincy or generate testable hypotheses that could satisfy only a portion of the healthcare constituency, namely the religious portion. I would argue by definition, a partial explanation of chaplaincy will always be inadequate for at least two reasons. First, because the larger portion of those who make decisions about where and how to spend the healthcare dollars do not share a religious perspective or do not necessarily share a religious perspective. And secondly, because a partial explanation of chaplaincy will be an inequitable explanation. I'm clear, in my mind, 
that any explanation of chaplaincy, middle range or general, needs to make sense. Yes, the religious believers of all types, not just Christians, Jews and Muslims, but the full spectrum of religious belief, but also to spiritual pilgrims, the so-called nuns, or the spiritual but not religious types. And also, and this I think is crucial, it also has to make sense to those who might be classed as free thinkers, the atheists, the agnostics, the humanists, etc. Anything else, I submit, is insufficient and uh, it's insufficient to adequately support the transformation of chaplaincy, not just from a religious ministry, which it obviously has been, into a, uh, into a research-informed, evidence-based professional practice, but into a professional practice that is properly inclusive, accessible and available to all. So, my substantive concern with religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory is that it misses an opportunity to make an important contribution to how we understand and talk about professional chaplaincy. By choosing to talk about patients who make use of religion and spirituality, religiously informed, relationally skillful chaplaincy theory, I think, narrows professional chaplaincy's reach to a subsection of those who may have spiritual needs. And my feeling is that it, this needn't have been the case. Had Judith and Kate chosen to examine belief rather than religion, they would have significantly widen the range of their model uh, to have been genuinely inclusive. Now, again, I think this may be a problem of linguistics. What is obvious in reading research papers uh, from both sides of the Atlantic is that North American researchers and writers choose to conflate religion and spirituality into religion stroke spirituality, thereby making them more or less interchangeable. While on this side of the Atlantic, European writers choose to make a distinction, arguing, for example, that religion is to spirituality what painting is to the arts. So I think this conflation, while it may make sense with, in North America, is, is myopic. I also think um, choosing not to look at spirituality and, 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 and co uh, concentrating on religion. Um, while religion, it can be argued, is about beliefs, it's exclusive. It excludes those people who hold no religion. And I don't believe as chaplains we can afford to do that. As I've noticed, noted, um, language constructs reality, and the reality is that this use of language means that those who may be spiritual, and that includes atheists and agnostics, um, spiritual but not religious, are likely to be marginalized from the conversation. Uh, and at worst, they may even absent themselves from the conversation. Now, Steve, really do you mind if I um, um, jump in really quick and uh, we need to give some time for Lori to respond as well. Okay, I'm just about to wrap up. Um, can I have two, two seconds? Absolutely. I realize that Judith and Kate may feel that I've been too harsh and if I've been in any way unfair with the critique, I'm genuinely sorry and I offer my apologies. But I would reiterate that I think they've offered us a logically convincing argument that may very well convince certain managers and commissioners, the religious ones, uh, and help them to better understand the value of chaplaincy. But if chaplaincy is going to complete its transformation into a research-informed, evidence-based professional practice, it's genuinely inclusive, accessible, and available to all, then I believe it needs better and that we need to work harder at explaining what it is that we do in ways that will generate testable hypotheses. Thank you for your indulgence. Corey, would you like to um, offer some comments? Yeah, I have uh, just a few comments. Um, 
and and thoughts. Uh, again, I want to thank um, Judith and Kate for um, uh, presenting this uh, theory and this um, and this opportunity to, to to talk about this and just the opportunity to talk about what is a theory, what is a model, what does it mean for the profession of chaplaincy. So um, I have just a, a few things that uh, I I can just offer from my um, point of view, my perspective. Um, you, for me, this this function as a theory, and um, the reason it functioned as a theory for me was because it it poses a question and it answers it, and um, and this is part of my a struggle with sort of research informed evidence based. Uh, protocol. That is, um, I, I think it's very interesting that we have a re, um, relationally skilled aspect, particularly uh, component two that you talked about, this relationally skilled um, uh, really model of interaction that chaplains have, but yet our research and our theories do not uh, prioritize relationships. This is one of the reasons it's a theory to me because it talks about a concept and an idea um, in a um, you know this mid-range descriptive way, and it does it without prioritizing relationship. And I feel like that's what we have to do as a profession to talk to other disciplines that don't prioritize relationship, and and that theory, um, our theory has to be um, removed from our greatest strengths to be considered theory. And um, so I, I, I wonder, uh, given what for me is functioning as a theory and a model both, that's a very good explanation and look at what we do, what new reality is being created? What is the new reality? Um, and it seemed to me part of the new reality is to have more compliant patients and families and less interdisciplinary hierarchy. Um, and, and for me, um, this goes for me, what, what I am concerned about in my teaching and in my work is basically decolonizing the research question. So to me, this kind of does enforce some uh, supremacist and capitalist concerns that people who don't have our expertise, I think as Steve said, who make decisions about chaplaincy uh, don't have the relational skills that we have. And we have to speak their language instead of perhaps having a theoretical base where we bring people into our language. I think when theory does not really analyze power, um, it is hard to create a mental model or a theoretical base that is not, uh, I want to say, colonized or um, uh, really uh, takes into account a Eurocentric point of view. Um, for example, uh, uh, this, you know, research has to be very specific, like the question is specific, and then uh, the way you go about uh, proving the question or, uh, or theorizing it and then describing it um, using lots of source data, um, it's, it's to me more individualistic. It has an individualistic feel to it. Whereas a worldview that's communal wouldn't sort of be looking for a, um, just an answer to a very tiny um, question. It would have more par paradox it would have more complexity. It would have more connections. So I, um, it's it's wonderful how all the connections are made through the resources that you give us to read about other, other, um, other research uh, efforts and uh, publications. Um, but it 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 comes for me to be um, a, a a a colonized point of view. That is. Uh, power is not analyzed. Why are chaplains' voices not heard in interdisciplinary teams? Why are we working to be have a voice? It's because disciplines 
have a power relationship. And and when, why are people who are not, don't, don't have the expert we have, doing so much writing about spirituality? Um, what would it be like for this question of um, what does it mean to, to care? Sort of what are the, the divine capacities that we work with in our expertise as chaplains? How does the um, belief systems of those on a dis in a disciplinary team, that is, for example, how quality of life is assessed or um, how, um, how uh, religious adherence is assessed. Uh, how is that influenced by issues of structural oppressions? So that um, if you have a someone who has a scientific model uh, and, and maybe don't, don't, they say they don't let their religious preferences influence their work, which of course isn't really true, but um, say that they actually believe that they're neutral or they're um, objective. I think that makes this conversation and the value of what we offer, um, it, it's like we're saying, yes, uh, SR is important and to a team that may not be very conscious that they have a SR point of view, uh, a RS point of view. Um, whatever, however that might be, um, be played out, whether it's sort of the scientific impair, uh, 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 model or other ways of, um, that they do their practice. So um, I, I'll, I'll end by saying, um, well, how, what if we imagined a new social, uh, religious social alternative to to what's happening now in healthcare. Um, this this um, RS of distress, um, you know, distress has never been just distress for those who are uh, um, uh, under systems of oppression. Just as disease has never just been disease. I mean, this really plays out even if we look at. What happened this year with COVID? All the people of color who died so pervasively, it's because disease is not just disease and distress is not just distress. And I think chaplains have skill that really um, allows people to uh, engage those kinds of things. So um, I, I just wonder what it would be like to imagine an alternative to the interdisciplinary hierarchy. I mean, why do, what if we, yes, explain what we do, but also change, change the structure of, of healthcare? I mean, can we even imagine that? And I think that's even hard to imagine because our mental models are so colonized. Um, so um, I, I'm not looking for a theory of everything. I'm, I, I'm looking for theories that are complex, that are paradoxical and that are connected. And um, I would really like to see our expertise be able to be used in a way where we're, we're not um, hesitant to talk about the relational aspect of theory. What if we prioritize relationship instead of prioritize the concept that we then explain when our expertise is in actual the, the relationship building and understanding the theory of of that. Um, this is an unrelated, unrelated sort of to what I just said, but I also want to say, because um, I recently created a job description um, for uh, a chaplain position, and none of the relational skilled uh, uh, aspects that you had in your paper or were in the job description or, in, or, or the job descriptions I looked for. And so I'm just thinking that um, one of the ways we can help spread what we do is by adjusting our job descriptions. I just did mine to put this, this, these set of skills in the job description. They really are not in job descriptions. 
And uh, so that's like, I know that's very practical and that's not theoretical, but I think it is a part of how we miss opportunities to let other people on interdisciplinary teams know what we do. So um, thank I, you, Lori. <laughs> some sense. Uh, I'd, we have a little more time. I'd like to invite Judy and Kate to um, res any responses that you might have to either Lori or to Steve. Um, yes, I, I would like to say first thank you for the care with which you've read our article and the um, thoughtful feedback that you bring. Um, Steve, I know many people think this is not a theory and I my understanding is a, a theory is what guides a model of practice, and so that's not a conversation that I would consider beneficial at this moment. I do, though, want to say that I think my concept is the theory we've put forth is a strategic essential piece for chaplaincy. I think medicine is taking over, looking at how people use religion. We've got a um, spiritually integrated social work article out there. Psychology is doing a ton with how people use religion and spirituality. Nursing certainly thinks it's part of their bailiwick. I think if we do not own it, it's a huge field that if we're trying to be all things to all people, because a lot of different people have beliefs, and we certainly provide care for people who don't have religious or spiritual beliefs. I do think to say that focusing on religion is ignoring other people is no more true than to say a cardiologist doesn't care about the brain. I am saying we have got areas of focus that we need to bring our expertise to, not because of ourselves, but because patients are using their beliefs in this way. And so for me, it's about the patient. What are they doing? We are not imposing religion at all. Chaplaincy has spent a ton of time, at least in CPE, ignoring the specifics of the ways people use religion. So I think that's a corrective that's needed. And Lori, we certainly did not address power and it's a huge topic. And I wonder if we thought about um, power through this lens, what we could bring to the question of the transformation of healthcare that is certainly not something we did and i am aware that time is short and i can sure keep talking i will say we have two open positions at cincinnati children's and i mentioned if this is a theory that appeals to you we need a psych chaplain and a NICU chaplain um kate thank you both for your incredibly thoughtful responses i think that I am walking away holding two pieces, particularly from what you've you've um, shared. I um, I really again appreciate this analysis of power. I think that power is a huge piece of practice. Power is something that we as chaplains navigate and negotiate. We use for good and for ill every day. Um, and and there's a, there is a piece there. Uh, there is a there was an impetus I think in our writing of this. Um, of this sense that why is it that it sometimes feels that other members of the IDT team have more power even around religion, spirituality, and I will include belief. Um, and so how do we navigate that and do so in a relationally skillful way? Um, Steve, I also really appreciate this note that our theories have got to be fully inclusive of all those we serve, um, all of our stakeholders. Um, I. I do think there may be a slight language difference, um, you know, how we talk about religion, spirituality, belief. Um, and I also acknowledge, as I did earlier, that this was um, this particular theory was born out of a medical center in a part of America uh, that is still highly religious. Um, I think I at one point looked through my census and and saw over 80% were folks who had told me they were deeply religious, attended um, religious services regularly, et cetera, et cetera. And so how do we then partner perhaps with you all over across the pond and in other places to find ways to take this theory to the next level, which would be fully inclusive of all, I think maybe with some language shifts, we could get there. Um, and I really appreciate this thinking of what, what is best for the development of chaplaincy as a profession. It's something I think about all the time, George thinks about all the time, um, and any of you listening, if you have thoughts about how we do this from a theoretical way, how we incorporate power, how we become inclusive in our theories, uh, I know we want to continue that conversation. Thank you all very much. 
Any other responses that anyone would like to give before we wrap up today? Well, I would like to thank you all so much um, to our presenters and our responders um, for your work and your research in our field of professional chaplaincy. Um, I know especially from uh, my perspective as chair of certification, um, any of these discussions that can um, impact how we talk about what we do, how we claim what we do, and then actually do it, how we put these things into practice. Um, is so essential to, um, to our work as professional chaplains. So thank you all for your contribution to that um, here today and, and all the work that you do. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you who joined us today um, online. Um, there is handouts that um, are available um, here as well. And um, I just have seen in the chat that the presentation, the um, PowerPoint presentation will be available as well when the recording um, goes live. So thank you all again for joining us today um, on this really um, important presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Is this a situation where we debrief what we've been through or do we wish each other well and go eat lunch based on your